50 years ago, um, there was this um, burst of innovation um, and excitement uh, in, in New York City. And uh, the only credibility that I have to discuss this is two things. One, I was eight years old at the time, and I went there and I got to go to uh, see the, what the future, what Tomorrowland was going to look like. Um, I was in the Bronx, so it wasn't much of a trip to go there, and we went there on a regular basis. Um, and then I've been 35 years at a firm uh, in which was founded originally by Lev Zetlin, who, uh, who was the uh, engineer for 13 of the pavilions at the, uh, at the World's Fair. So over those 35 years, I've been hearing stories, all kinds of stories throughout the year that I always felt terrible that the only ones who got to hear it were the, were the kind of the folks that were inside and hearing those stories, because it was a pretty exciting and, and, and uh, wild story. Um, but tonight we want to really cover, I want to cover three things. I want to cover the history, what it was like during that period of time. Um, during the, where there was this little burst of innovation uh, and where um, a group which you're going to hear that what was um, barely out of diapers um, and, and I, won't, I won't translate that into the future, we'll let that go um, was, was, was doing some groundbreaking structures and designs that had never been done before. Um, and so first we want to talk about that history, what was it about that period, what was it like to work in that period um, and how did that all come together? Um, then the second thing we want to talk about is some specifics about three of the most um, uh, uh, unique pavilions at the time, uh, which were the New York State Pavilion, the Travelers, and the Kodak Pavilion. There were several others, but from a structural and from an architectural standpoint, many people point to those as the really iconic uh, and, and groundbreaking uh, buildings that were both designed and, and built at that point. And then after talking about them in a little detail, we're going to spend a little time talking really about lessons learned and what can we take away now um, from what was done back then to look at a city in New York where, in all honesty, having been in this profession for 35 years and worked in and around New York and around the world, where that level of innovation uh, has, while we've seen pockets of it here and there in design and construction in New York, we really haven't seen a steady stream of it since then. It, it kind of came in a flash. There were some remnants. We see it here and there. And the question is, what's happened in the last 50 years that hasn't allowed that to take to be something that just gets renewed, where, where that type of innovation, that type of seat of your pants doing exciting new designs didn't take hold and lead to more of those types of buildings and projects in the city. And so the, the hope is that we can go um, listen to this group, get a little feedback on that, and maybe come away with some um, thoughts about how we can move things forward in New York to get to kind of get our innovation groove back. Um, with that, I'd like to introduce our illustrious panel. Um, let me start with uh, Vincent De Simone. Uh, uh, can I call you Vinny, or do I have to stick with Vincent? Vince, Is it? Please. Vince, Vince. Vince. Okay, My Vince. Cousin Vinny doesn't write. All right. So. <laughs> And uh, just before I even get into this, I, I'm, my role here is in, in supposedly to moderate, um, but I'm, I'm not even, I'll do my best, but uh, having spoken to them on the phone and over the years, uh, moderation is not what this group does well. So uh, if this conversation is probably going to go where they want it to go, and occasionally I might call a timeout, but uh, we'll see where that goes. So um, uh, Lev Zetlin, a little known engineer in 1962 with a small firm, was catapulted to national recognition by being awarded 13 pavilions in the 1964 World's Fair. At the time, Vincent de Simone was Lev's man in the field, and although himself a 20-something, Vincent was the adult in charge of the other 20-somethings to make it all happen. <laughs> Vince went on to found one of the, uh, the, one of the leading New York-based structural engineering firms, de Simone Consulting Engineers, where he is the chairman today. Charlie, I, I, I guess they all know who Vince is, but maybe Vince. Charlie Thornton, there it is. I, I need to know who I am. Right. <laughs> Charlie Thornton to my right. Um, um, Charlie, who was uh, still working on his master's degree in civil engineering at NYU in 1963, was a project leader for Lev Zetlin and worked on several pavilions, um, the Kodak, New York State, uh, and, and several others. He and Richard Tomasetti, and Richard's in the audience, where is he? Um, uh, eventually converted Lev uh, uh, Zetlin's firm into what today is Thornton Tomasetti. Uh, Charlie retired as co-chairman of the firm in 2004 
and as a serial entrepreneur, will happily tell you about all the firms he's established since then. And he's got his book here, and, and he's going to be hawking this book all night long. So it just, it just came out. So um, Ken Hiller, raise your hand, Ken. That's he can, and it's there. You go. You got it up there. Hold it up there. There you go. Actually, Dr. Ken, Kenneth Hiller, as, as he is, as given, he's given an honorary degree by everybody around him. Um, <laughs> yes, Dr. Kenneth Hiller had a long and distinguished career in design and construction. In 1964, he was a vice president and one of the few, I guess you were an adult, right? What, what, uh, you, were, you were just, uh, just the, the only adult. you were the only adult in the group. Um, yes, back in 64, you were an adult, correct, yes. Still not an adult. Okay. <laughs> with Ingalls Iron Work and supervised the steel construction of several pavilions uh, and Shea Stadium. Um, so Ken, as you know, we always say that you, you, you know you're successful when you actually outlive your project. So, so you've got that going for you. Also, they all retired, so I'm not sure. So I can say anything. Right. And finally, last but not least, actually, Alan is, is last and least, but we're not going to get into that. Uh, Frank Marino. Um, Frank came into this panel all the way from, from his home in uh, San Rafael, California. Uh, Frank was a project um, uh, engineer also with Lev Zetlin. He worked in the New York, on the New York State Pavilion, uh, and he couldn't keep Charlie in check then, so we're giving him another chance. I actually should have put you between Charlie and, and Vince over here, but um, didn't want to do that to you. Um, he is, uh, Frank later joined with Vincent and was in charge of uh, DeSimone Consulting Engineers in the Bay Area. And after this, he's got a really tough job. He's heading off with his lovely wife off to, to Italy. So um, that's, uh, we, I, thought, I thought maybe we could switch, but he, he didn't go for that. And then Alan, let me just, hopefully Alan will show up. But if he doesn't, you'll have his bio, and you can send him a really a nasty emails and, and, and say, where were you? Um, and maybe this is because of what his introduction's about. He's our lone esteemed voice of the beleaguered architect. Um, uh, Joined, he actually joined Philip Johnson in 1970, so again, he was late to the party. Um, but Johnson was the architect of several pavilions and has been quoted as saying that Lev Zetlin was his favorite engineer because he, Lev, could think like an architect. While with Johnson Burgee, Allen worked during the immediate wake of the World's Fair's influence, participating in designs such as the AT&T headquarters and Times Square Center. Uh, Allen, as a participant and a witness to the immediate effects of the World's Fair's influence, uh, so we will value his thoughts if he ever shows up. Um, so with that, um, again, what I want to focus on is, as we all know, I don't know if how many of you have been reading some, a lot of the recent articles that are out there, there's a lot of mixed bag reviews of the, of the World's Fair. Um, everything from financially, it wasn't a success. There's, there's a lot of discussions about, um, about the you know, Moses and how it was pulled off. But there's no question, I was just reading, an there was, a, uh, I think in the last week, an Ar Architectural Digest that talked about the influence that it had on, on young people at that time, many of who went in to become engineers and architects because what they saw in those two years. And it was really these incredible structures and pavilions that were built. Yes, you know, it's a small world which uh, we can never get out of our heads after having been there and gone on that ride. But it, I know, for one, it was something that had a huge impact on me at that point. And if you, there's, there's lots of architects that point back to that moment as the moment that they got juiced about m moving into the field of architecture. And I know many engineers as well. So let me sit down because while you know, I'm, I'm a couple of years younger, but I'm not going to stand for an hour and a half. So. Yeah. Right, is that OK? This is working. Yeah, but I'll, I think I can work here, and you can, these should work, right? Hello? They work. All right, Hello? so we're good. Uh, so the way we're going to work this, I'm going to kick off a question with one of our esteemed uh, colleagues here. They're going to start it off, and then we'll, we'll let the scrum begin. Um, Tom, I'm only, I have an issue with one thing. Beleaguered architects? What? Architects are not beleaguered. They're beleaguerers. <laughs> you see, I have no control over this, so we know where this is going. Okay. All right. So. Uh, let's kick it off with Vince. Vince, um, when, what, when the first, how, did the, how did it come into the office of, of Lev Zetlin? What was it about Lev, a relatively unknown, that allowed him to get these 13 pavilions? And, and how, did you, how did you all first hear about it? You were running the office. How many years out of Manhattan College were you at that point? Five. Five years. And you were running the office for Lev. So tell us how it happened yeah. and, and um, you know, what was it about Lev that actually allowed him to get those 13 pavilions? Well, I think 
what I need to do uh, to answer your question, let's take a look at the, uh, at the atmosphere. I mean, here we were in New York State. We had the state of New York very interested in making a real show of the United States and so forth. Now, we were a bunch of guys, and Lev, by the way, was not an unknown. Here's the key. Lev had what I'll call a Boswell to his Johnson, a fellow named Fisher. Fisher was a writer for progressive architecture. And every time Lev said something, Fisher would write this fantastic article about how great he was. Now, not to take that away, Lev was a great engineering conceiver. He could conceive structures. The second thing he knew how to do was he knew how not to hide his skill from the public. So here we have a World's Fair coming up. Here we have a group of people expecting innovative, creative structures, and who do we have that we can go to? You have either, you have Severed, okay? Severed did the St. Louis Arch as well as the Raleigh Convention, and then you had Zetland. Zetland did the first decent bicycle wheel up at the Ithaca Auditorium. He did work for Johnson. So when this came, all these things came, what did these corporations have? They had to look at who they believed were the true innovators in structures, and Zetlin was one of them because of his background and the things that he did. He also had a very nice name, Lev Zetlin. People loved that foreign name, Israeli. He was terrific. Av, Arab. I mean, you know, architects love these two name things. They make them very, very successful. But <laughs> Vincent J. D. Simone, no, 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 I'll never make it. But nevertheless, that was the background. I wanted to let you know what was going on. Philip Johnson, he had the New York State Pavilion. I could tell you how he got it. He got it through a fellow named uh, uh, Archer, who was a, uh, a relative of uh, Nelson Rockefeller. Nelson wanted this. So let me give you this, this kind of atmosphere. I'm trying to create or recreate the newness, the wonderfulness, the things that we were about to see. I mean, at the time this was all going on, everybody was shuffling for what needed to be done. There was no time. And all of this was happening, and Lev was getting New York State Pavilion, Travelers, which was very, very important, and the Kodak, which, believe it or not, was the surface of the moon, amongst others. So with that background is the thing I wanted to let you know. People came to him. They really had no other choice. There really was no people that were outstanding, engineers outstanding, in so far as creativity was concerned. I hope I answered that, Tom. Yeah, you did. Uh, but going back to you coming to the firm, how did you at that age of 25 walk in the door one day, go from a graduate of Manhattan College to five years, essentially running the office and having and having hired some of the people that are also sitting sitting here? I mean, if it's about me, it was tremendous ambition. I, I went to school. Zetlin was my teacher at Manhattan College. I learned a lot about him. And frankly, when I got out of college, he was the one I wanted to work for. Zetlin had the ability to make, I don't know, I'm going to get in trouble with this, the easy look difficult and the difficult look impossible, and then he would solve the impossible and everybody would cheer him and they would give him new buildings. So with all due respect, when you want to be a good engineer today and you want to be very successful, you have to be a showman. I'm sorry to say that, but that's how you distinguish yourself from your other very, very credible adversaries. Most structural engineers are very, very intelligent and I'm proud to be a member of that group, but you know that you really have to get into newspapers. And I'm telling you, this guy Fisher was very, very instrumental in exposing Lev's talent and the things that he had to do. I walked into the office when I was 21. We started to build it. There was nobody in the office. There was three people. We started to build it. We started to get this work. And then in around 1962 came the whole issue about where these buildings are coming from. It was really strange, if I may relate. I mean, the Mexican pavilion came to us by some guy said, hey, buddy, you want to come and do the Mexican pavilion? I said, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. So I went down to Chamber Street. There was this big fat guy behind a desk with old Danish crumbs on his vest. He had coffee stains on the table. And he says, uh, you know, I got an inside track in Mexico. I got a brother that knows the president. I said, well, okay. <laughs> that, that's really very cool. I like that. That's very nice, you know, so forth. So what we did, we joined the team. And obvious, for real reasons, he fell out. He was not the guy, but we got the introduction through that. Uh, the business about the New York State Pavilion, well, there's other anecdotes other people can tell, but uh, what the other buildings came on simply, once you had one and once you had two, 
Now, I have to say this, and I may be out of line or out of order with this, but, you know, we did the Wisconsin Cheese Pavilion. I don't want you to think everything are these three wonderful buildings. The Wisconsin Cheese Pavilion looked like a big wheel of cheese. <laughs> and, I mean, if you knew the World's Fair, there were these extraordinary buildings. And there's a lot of, like, the American Express was brought in on four trailers, and it was kind of glued together. And, uh, you know, the, the other pavilions were wonderful. I mean, General Motors, Ford, and all that. But I'm going to leave it to, to Ken to describe that. But uh, it started to come in, really, in 1962. What I did is I, you know, I was in awe of what was going on. We had some really good people. We had Charlie, who was there. We had Frank that was there. We had a couple of other guys. And the shocking thing is we all knew each other. Okay, all five of us that were at Zetland's office were from Manhattan College. We knew each other. There was a bond, a camaraderie, and, uh, and uh, whether, I don't know, I guess graduating with 160 credits for a bachelor's degree, it kind of made you a little bit either stupid or smart, but uh, that's where we came from at that time. All right, so Charlie, Frank, you come in afterwards. Uh, Charlie, talk, talk about what it was. You were still going to school. So the whole concept of, of you actually out there both in academia at that point and then getting the opportunity to work in, in Lev's office, what was your first take walking into that world? And then what was your first, when was, were the World's Fair pavilions your first projects that you worked with on? Or was there something else that went on that led you to be getting involved in the, uh, in the New York State and others? Zetlin had stopped teaching at Manhattan, but there were so many Manhattan college people at Zetlin's office, all five of them, <laughs> that I had done my senior project on the U Utica Municipal Auditorium, which was Zetlin's first bicycle wheel roof in the United States. He had the patents on it. And this is pure coincidence. I had done my senior project in structural engineering on Geron and Celsa were the architects. I don't think they're around anymore. OK, but it was a, it was a very large bicycle wheel roof, which is basically take your bicycle with the spokes, the hub and the rim, and put it on 10 bricks in your front yard or in your apartment, and that's the bicycle wheel roof, okay? So I'm sitting in my structural class in 19, May of 1961, and there's a phone call from Vincent De Simone to Vincent Vitagliano. Does anybody want a summer job designing flat plate apartment houses in New York City? There's a zoning change. They, they, they pulled back the buildings. They became taller. They became less, uh, less fat. And I said, yeah, I need a summer job. Uh, I'm going to graduate school in September at NYU. I'm getting married in September. And I went down and I met Vincent D. Simone, and he hired me. And that was the beginning, okay? So I, I, was, I was a graduate student full-time. I was also working about 32 hours a week for NYU, I mean, from, for Zetlin. And all of a sudden, the stuff starts happening. All of a sudden, there's New York State Pavilion. There's the, the Travelers. There's the Hawaiian Pavilion. The, 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 the Green Bay Packers cheese heads. The, uh, the Mexican Pavilion, and George Fetish unfortunately couldn't be here, but the architect was Eduardo Terraza de la Pena, and he used to walk around the office singing this song, because we never saw him. Eduardo Terraza de la Pena, it's been a long time since I seen you. <laughs> Remember that? <laughs> we, we were all young, we were having fun, and I, I moved into, and we'll get into it in more detail. I got the Travelers Pavilion. Frank got the New York State Pavilion. Vince was on the, the uh, uh, Eastman Kodak project. But an interesting point, which people don't know, Conn and Jacobs were the architects on uh, Travelers mm -hmm. and New York State. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, and uh, okay. Eastman Kodak. But the designer on that was Donald Desky. It was an industrial designer, and the designer on Eastman Kodak was Will Burton. You may not know these names, but Elliot Noyes and all these great industrial designers that were around in the 50s and the 60s, they got the contracts, and then they, with the owner, went out and picked the architects. So that's an unknown sort of fact about this stuff, because it's not the way it is today. It's much more the architect gets the job up front. So Frank, you 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 join you you come into this the group 
and and uh, uh, like you said, I said, I was going to put you between these two just to see if you could break them up. So what was it like? What was the dynamic that you already saw when you came into this? Well, and I, I came to uh, Zetlin in uh, 61, a few months after Charlie, and I had just finished uh, graduate school, my uh, master's degree at Columbia, and a classmate of mine, George Fetish, who unfortunately cannot be here tonight because of, uh, of some health concerns, uh, I forget if he called me or I, I'd called him. I was working somewhere else while I was going to graduate school, and he said, he told me that he had just started with Lev Zetlin, whom we had as a teacher at Manhattan College, and George was a classmate of mine. These two guys were actually behind me. They're, they're younger than I We're am. We're a lot younger. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I went up to, yeah. I went up to uh, interview with, uh, with Dr. Zetlin. I didn't call him Lev until I worked for him for about 10 years. You know, so to me, he was always Dr. Zetlin. And I interviewed with him, and uh, he recruited me with, you know, the World's Fair projects had not really developed yet in the office, but he was telling me all about these great projects that were going to be coming and working with the architects like Philip Johnson. And ba bottom line is he convinced me to leave my job where I was making $98 a week and come to work for him for $92 a week. <laughs> and, 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 yeah, well, yeah. Um, what was it like? Um, you know, at, the, at first time, it was very mundane. You know, with, as Charlie, I think, pointed out, or Vince, uh, we were grinding out these flat plate apartment houses to beat the, uh, the zoning regulation. <laughs> And the, uh, the actual World's Fair uh, projects didn't start until maybe six, eight months after. We got the, the contracts, uh, as I recall, around 70, I mean, 62. And that's when, uh, uh, here I am in 1962, what, a 24, 25-year-old, you know, still wet behind my ears and out of, just out of diapers, as Tom said. And this... Uh, this project is literally thrown into my lap by, by Dr. Zetlin. And um, we, we, we made it work. You know, we, uh, we, we, we just uh, delved into it. We were all young at the time. I know you're going to hear a lot uh, uh, tonight that all, all we had to work with was uh, a post slide rule and uh, uh, logarithmic tables and a, and a crank calculator. It was not even electric. And uh, we, we got ourselves into the projects. And uh, I have to say that um, one of the mainstays, quite frankly, uh, engineering-wise in the office, again, a, a man that can't be here tonight because he's passed away was Jim Chapel, was uh, immeasurably helpful uh, to us young guys at the time in, in getting through these uh, relatively complex uh, structural uh, engineering problems. Um, but um, at the time, Tom, we didn't think of it as, as something different. I don't know. Th there well, was you know, what was it? You know, Vince talks about how, um, you know, Lev was this great salesman, you know, a, yeah. con a great conceiver of designs and a great salesman. And a great did he salesman. sell you all on coming to work? How did you? Yeah. Was that, you know, I mean, you, how did he get you? Was it? Was you, it? W one of the questions you asked in, 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 in the outline that we spoke about, we said, how, how did Lev uh, staff up for the World's Fair projects? Well, he actually pre-staffed by, re by recruiting us all. We really didn't staff at any, any staff to do the World's Fair projects. All the, the World's Fair projects were uh, accomplished by the, by the existing staff. All right, um, Ken, Doc Dr. Ken. Give yes. us a little. Give us a little flavor for what was the construction industry like back then. We all know what it, we walk around the city today and we see the scaffolding and we see the cranes and everything else. What What was it that not not to, in particular to? We'll get into the details of these projects. But what was it like working? You were working on other things. What was it like working in the construction before industry back I, then? Before I, uh, I talk about that, these two guys are very retiring. He's saying you have to be a, you have to be a type A um, personality to be an engineer. Look at these two. They're quiet people. So, the, so they, they're the exception that, that uh, prove the rule. I'll accept that. <laughs> the last time anybody else. 
What was construction like? Yeah, what was it like? Well, you know, I'm a little more pragmatic than you guys. I'm not a, I'm not a Zetlinite. I'm not a great fan of Zetlin because I work with him. He's a brilliant man, no question about it, but not an easy man. Um, and uh, as far as we did, uh, I guess our company, I was a steel guy. Our company did about, I don't know, six or eight pavilions at least, including New York State Pavilion, IBM, General Motors Pavilion, and a few others. <coughs> But, uh, and, and, all, and Shea Stadium and a lot of these bridge work and viaducts around New York at that time, like the Gowanus and the Van Wick, et cetera, et cetera. So we did a lot of work in that area. What was it like? Uh, construction is a pretty slow moving operation. It's not a hell of a lot different. Uh, there are some, you know, innovations. The kangaroo cranes came with the, uh, with the World Trade Center. Um, and now, of course, you know how I am, Charlie. I'm, a whiz on a computer, you know. I had to get, I had to get people. He has a pink laptop. I, I, I had to pay people to help uh, transform my hand scratchings into computer speak for my thesis and all of that. But uh, yeah, it was very expensive, by the way. And um, uh, what was it like? There were far fewer constraints. We have. We had far less to work with. When somebody decided they wanted to build a building, it got designed and they built it. And we didn't have to worry about um, uh, the environmental protection. We didn't have to worry about the, the neighborhood groups. We just built the buildings, and they went up a lot faster. There are, today, it takes probably, I guess you guys know better than I, sometimes years to get this thing just approved through all of the, all the stuff that goes on. And it's going to get more so, I suspect, with, um, with sustainability. Um, but there were no... Uh, I, I can't say there were any huge changes. I mean, but basic I think we'll fabric. get into that later. I think that's part of the basic the, the fabric story. Of, why, 50 years later, there well, isn't fundamentally the well, way we build. I mean, there are better cranes. There's there's much more safety. The guys running around, these these old uh, <coughs> foremen running around with with uh, uh, <coughs> but do you, iPads and that kind of thing. Give me a little background on how your firm was awarded this. Was this something that you competed no. for? Or was no. it? A, was it? Well, uh, our firm, which was a very large uh, steel co contractor at the time, called Ingalls Ironworks, uh, we made a deal with Starrick Brothers and Egan. I, they're, they're a very large company at the time. Uh, it's not Starrick, but Starrick Brothers and Egan. A guy by the name of John Mee. You remember John Mee? Yep. He was the president. So he brought us in, and it was it was one of the earliest, what will I say, design um, development. We work with the designers right from the, right from the get-go. We work with Frank here uh, a great deal on the details because, you know, the de who said this? Louis the S Sullivan or somebody? De the devil is in the details, as we all, uh, maybe you don't know, but I know. Um, so we work with Frank here, and we one of the things we're trying to figure out, aside from the, de the actual details, is how to build this bloody thing. We, we, had, we, we had internal conferences in different ways. The only two ways to do it was in the air or on the ground. But, you know, in the air was the, it would have been a normal way, but the scaffolding and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, just seemed like it was, it was just outrageous. We had two pieces of paper, scheme A, scheme B, uh, so to speak. And uh, we started listing scheme A, what we thought we would have to do there, and scheme B. Scheme B would be the, would be the jacking. But, Ken, before you get into the detail, because we're going to hit on the details of those, how how did they get awarded it? They just, well, was it? It was awarded. I, it was just awarded to us. The state awarded me, Star, uh, not me, but right. <laughs> Jack me. Well, uh, uh, so let me let me transition to that. The state. Uh, the other the other one thing I'd like you all to kind of talk about it was what was the environment with government back there? We know this was clearly this was the age of the the, the tail end age of Moses. This was an age where Rockefeller was very involved in this. What was government's role in this, and, and, and what was the environment from a govern, government standpoint well, and a regulatory standpoint I, back I then? I can answer that pretty quickly. The government was, except when we got the job, Moses, of course, was a, bull, was a bulldog. He was a bulldozer, and he got things done. Um, the government n never really got involved. I, as an example, I don't know how many of you people work for the Port. Are anybody here from the Port Authority? I hope not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> OK, can we shut the mics down now? Yeah. We're not taping, are we? No, no. <laughs> The Port Authority in those days was a pleasure to work with. We, we, <laughs> do I have to say any more? And it was, it's true. We go up there and, and we negotiate things and, and we get things done. Well, that's, that, was, that was then, this is now. Um, 
but there was very little government uh, interference. Very, the regulations were minimal, you know, regulation. Yeah, George, right. The, uh, the New York World's Fair was really Robert Moses' brainchild, but the real player that really motivated it was a Colonel Corps of Engineers guy. Was it Potter? I don't forget his name, but there was a Corps of Engineers retired colonel who basically took over the job and ramrodded it like I've never seen anything ever, ever before. And just to put things in perspective, the 60s, early 60s was still, we were still coming back from World War II, Levittown, the GIs coming back, the world was positive, the war was over, even though we had Vietnam, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Korean War in the 50s, that was really just a blip. But the, the world was positive in 1960, 61, and 62, and everything just got decided. I mean, it was just, it was fabulous. And Zetlin was there at the right time. He had the big kahunas to basically say, I can do anything. And then he had all of us to do it. That's right. <laughs> one, other, one, other, one other point I'd like to make. Let's, let's, let's look in perspective just, because Tom, Tom is struggling as chairman of the Building Congress with innovation. But you know, we went on a roll through the 60s and everything was really, really going well until the early 70s when the Arab oil embargo basically almost destroyed New York. New York almost destroyed itself. And where did innovation go? It went away for about 10 years as a result of the Arab oil embargo, in my opinion, because nothing, there were no cranes on the streets in New York. So the World's Fair was an absolute aberration. It was a hiccup. It was a fabulous project. And Moses drove it. He just drove it. And so Ken, what were you were going to? I was going to say, do any of you remember when uh, a project had the architect, the structural engineer, the mechanical and electrical engineers, and the, I guess they could, in those days they called the foundation engineer, mm -hmm. period. How many, how many consultants are on a project now? Good-sized project. You need, you need a consultant to keep track of the consultants. And that, and that, that sort of explains a, a, a big difference in what goes on, what went on then and what goes on now. So Vince, last thing, you were, you're, 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 you were running the office for left. Does that mean you were the guy that was signing the contracts? Where, how, did the, how did the deals get done from, from your end? And who did you interface with on, was it, was it the government? Was it, was it the architects? Who, who were you working for and, and how was that? How was that done? Was that all Lev do, doing those deals, or were you involved doing those? No, I mean, I, I was there with Lev because, to, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I was there with Lev because, uh, you know, I started, I was only a three-man office when I joined him for Manhattan. So I had a certain secure position with him and a certain confidence. So he would take me to these meetings and so forth. But I know with uh, Johnson, it was strictly his, him and the work he had done with Philip before that that selected him. And uh, you know, I used to go up to, to, you know, to 375 Park Avenue, the Seagram's building, versus the guy in Chamber Street. These are two guys that gave us work. So you know, there was this kind of dichotomy of uh, where, the, where the work was being produced, you know, Danish Crumbs or the elegant Philip. But uh, I, I, I didn't sign any of these contracts because I was a minor almost. I was illegal. I don't think I was a PE at the time, to be candid with you. But uh, that's the only answer I could tell you. Left spearheaded the contracts and did all that. But once again, I just want to get back to the concept. A lot of people don't understand. Zetlin always had somebody that could initiate his great concepts. He had a fellow named Tiga Hermanson that 